The global trend towards de-dollarization is continuing. Nations around the world, even some of our closest allies, are diversifying their reserves and reducing their dependence on the dollar. Israel just announced that for the first time ever, it will be adding the Chinese yuan to its portfolio of reserves, while simultaneously reducing its dollar holdings. In addition to the yuan, Israel will be adding Australian and Canadian dollars to its reserves as well. And this article from Business Insider also mentions that, according to the IMF, the dollar share of the total global currency reserves has fallen to its lowest point in over two decades. And that theme is covered in much greater detail in this working paper published by the IMF back at the end of March titled The Stealth Erosion of Dollar Dominance. And I'll put a link in the description for anyone who wants to check this document out. It's about 40 pages long, so it's a bit of a read, but I'll read the abstract here for you, which gives you a pretty good idea of what this document is covering. We document a decline in the dollar share of international reserves since the turn of the century. This decline reflects active portfolio diversification by central bank reserve managers. It is not a byproduct of changes in exchange rates and interest rates, of reserve accumulation by a small handful of central banks with large and distinctive balance sheets, or of changes in coverage of surveys of reserve composition. Strikingly, the decline in the dollar's share has not been accompanied by an increase in the share of the pound sterling, yen, and euro, other long-standing reserve currencies and units that, along with the dollar, have historically comprised the IMF's special drawing rights. Rather, the shift out of dollars has been in two directions, a quarter into the Chinese renminbi, and three quarters into the currencies of smaller countries that have played a more limited role as reserve currencies. A characterization of the evolution of the international reserve system in the last 20 years is thus as gradual movement away from the dollar, a recent, if still modest, rise in the role of the renminbi, and changes in market liquidity, relative returns, and reserve management enhancing the attractions of non-traditional reserve currencies. These observations provide hints of how the international system may evolve going forward. So, as you can see, even according to the IMF, the trend towards de-dollarization has been in place for some time and is not likely to stop anytime soon. And that is also what this document from the Congressional Research Service tells us, that China and Russia have been planning for de-dollarization for more than a decade. And if you haven't seen the video about de-dollarization that I put out in March, you should check that out after this video because I do go into more detail on this document, so I'll put a link in the description to that video. And when it comes to the decline of a world reserve currency, it tends to happen slowly for a while and then suddenly all at once. And I believe that the recent advent of economic warfare and the weaponization of the financial system and the dollar could be the factor that accelerates the dollar's ultimate decline. The fact that even close allies of the U.S. like Israel are diversifying their currency holdings is a sign that nations around the world may be just a little concerned about their dependence on the dollar and the Western financial system in general. Russia also recently announced that it will no longer disclose the names of banks that get connected to its System for Transfer of Financial Messages, or SPFS. This is a system that Russia created back in 2014 when the U.S. first threatened to disconnect Russian banks from the SWIFT payment system. Why would they stop releasing the names of institutions connected to their system? Well, I'm sure that the economic warfare aimed at Russia has made other nations wary of getting on the wrong side of the West. Of course, the irony is that it is this very weaponization of the financial system that will ultimately drive other nations to seek alternatives such as the Russian payment system. And by allowing entities to anonymously connect to SPFS, they can do so without risking retribution by the U.S., Back on April 9th, at a meeting of the BRICS nations, and for those of you not familiar with that acronym, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, Russian Finance Minister Anton Sulanov called for the use of national currencies for export-import operations, the integration of payment systems and cards, our own financial messaging system, and the creation of an independent BRICS rating agency. SPFS is not the only SWIFT alternative. The Chinese have their own system as well the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System, or SIPS. And I would not be surprised if very soon we see a push to integrate the Russian SPFS with SIPS to create a system that can truly rival the Western financial system. In fact, integrating Russian and Chinese payment systems is something that has been in the works for some time now. This is an excerpt from an article published back in 2018 by the Fletcher School's U.S.-Russian Relations Initiative titled, How U.S. Sanctions Are Fostering Innovative Strategies for Resiliency in Russia. 
Russia has launched efforts to integrate SPFS and MIR with China's SIPs and union pay counterparts, integrate SPFS across the Eurasian economic zone, and expand MIR interoperability in Europe. These efforts are part of Russia's regional strategy to eliminate the U.S. dollar and the euro for trade, which began with Russian and Chinese central banks signing a three-year currency swap agreement worth $23.5 billion in 2015. Similar efforts of alternate payment system integration are being explored under the BRICS trading bloc with the creation of a $100 billion currency exchange pool in conjunction with BRICS New Development Bank, which is already financing $1 billion infrastructure projects in Russia. And just to clarify, Mir and UnionPay are the Russian and Chinese equivalents of Visa and MasterCard, so they have been working on an entirely self-contained financial system for years now. And recent events are absolutely going to kick those plans into overdrive, I am sure. So, will Israel adding some yuan to its reserves kill the dollar? Of course not. And will Russia building an alternative to SWIFT destroy Western finance? Far from it, I'm sure. But what we are looking at is death by a thousand cuts for the dollar. All of these events individually may seem minor, and their individual repercussions may indeed be small. But like the IMF said, this drift away from the dollar can provide hints of how the international system will evolve going forward. And to me, it seems like the dollar's days as the world reserve currency are numbered. And if anything, the U.S. is playing right into the hands of rivals like Russia and China by employing sanctions and financial warfare that sow doubt as to the reliability of the U.S. dollar as a safe store of value. Here's an interesting chart from Ray Dalio's recent book, The Changing World Order. This is an illustration of the steps a great power follows on its rise to the top and along its inevitable decline. You can see that number 16, the loss of reserve currency status, is one of the final steps along the path downward, coming just after large debts, money printing, and internal conflict. And unfortunately, we have checked all of those boxes, so the dollar's decline may be next. And that's why I am stacking gold and silver, assets that do not decline, but rather have preserved purchasing power for thousands of years as world powers have risen and fallen. And if you enjoyed this presentation and you'd like to see more videos about the economy, gold, silver, and what's going on in the world, then check out the videos popping up on your screen right now. Thank you all very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you next time. Smart Silver Stacker, out.